is the committee based on academic committee based on times and lectures as a committee member one of the most systematic is the least painful Vijay, can you hold the mic closer? Uh, Professor Raghavan will be talking on saturation for refined good recharge. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, I couldn't hear uh, most of what Vijay said, which is probably a good thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so can you see this? Yes, we can. We can. Is this, okay. So uh, despite uh, the technical terms in the title and in the abstract, this talk is going to be rather uh, simple. And uh, it should be accessible to uh, def definitely to MSc students. I would say even to BSc students and maybe even to high school students um, in a certain sense, as you will see. So till the very end, um, um, everything is elementary and uh, understandable. I should say more precisely that there is an elementary angle to it. There is uh, definitely higher mathematics for which you will need background, but there is an elementary layer to it and throughout the talk. And so you, you should be able to follow it, uh, uh, follow everything in the talk, except that uh, at certain points, I will indicate connections to various uh, uh, other branches of mathematics, uh, some of which you could just let it uh, wash over you. Okay. So here is the title, Saturation for Refined Littlewood Richardson, which I will always denote by LR. LR will stand for Littlewood Richardson Coefficients. So this is work in progress, joined with Murugendra Singh Kushwaha, who's a PhD student at IMSC, and Shankaran Viswanath, who's a professor at uh, IMSC, is a colleague of mine. So the, our theorem generalizes saturation for the usual or ordinary LR coefficients, by which I mean uh, without the refined there. So this is ordinary. And that is due to Knudsen and Tao from roughly uh, 2000 or maybe 1998, let's say. But unfortunately, it relies on the proof. So it or more precisely, what is called the high model version of their proof, and so does not give an independent proof. By the way, please do interrupt me at any point. I'm happy to be interrupted. I will define all the terms. Okay. Now, let me... ah, I'm having. So this is my second page. I have, I still haven't learned how to um, navigate properly in this uh, journal PP, but please bear with me. Okay. So LR coefficients, what are they? So the notation is C lambda mu nu. So lambda and mu as uh, subscripts and nu as superscript where lambda mu nu are partitions. Okay, we'll, I'll even define partition. We will anyway need notations for them. So, so these are the LR coefficients. So the LR co an LR coefficient is indexed 
by three partitions. We'll give four equivalent definitions of these. So not one, but I'll give you four of them. Um, one of them is the elementary one, which I expect you to follow. And the second one may be, and the, maybe the others are not so um, obvious, except if you have some background. But the first one definitely is an elementary definition. And it may not be obvious that the definitions that I give, four of them I claim, but the equivalence is that, the, that one of these definitions is equivalent to the other may not be obvious. But we will be interested in one particular interpretation. I will come to this later. This will become clear. Okay, so what is our notation for partition? So what is a partition? It's just a sequence of non-negative integers, lambda 1 bigger than or equal to lambda 2, bigger than or equal to lambda 3, eventually 0. So it's actually a finite set of integers which you arrange in non-decreasing, uh, did I say that correctly, non-increasing order, right? In or in weekly decreasing order. So you can also write it as lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3, etc. So here is an example, 5 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1. This is said to be a partition of 12 because 5 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 is actually 8 plus 2, 10 plus 2, 12. So this is this represents a partition of 12. Right? So we, we denote that by the modulus of lambda and that is the sum of these numbers and that is 12 in this example. And with every partition, we can associate a shape called the Young shape. Young, this Young stands for the name of a mathematician. Name of a mathematician. Alfred Young, um, I think he was British. Um, uh, and he worked in um, a finite group representation theory, especially the symmetric group representation theory and related combinatorics. So what do we mean by the shape of lambda? So you draw a picture like this. So you draw five boxes in the first row, three boxes in, in a row in the second row because it's five plus three plus two plus one plus one. So two boxes below that and one here. So I hope this is clear. Uh, these boxes are uh, left justified and top justified. By the way, can you, I hope you can see my uh, cursor. I'm using it as a pointer. Hello, Vijay or Pranav, is, uh, is the, is, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay. okay. By the way, if there is any technical problem or mathematical problem, please uh, feel free to stop me. I'm happy to be interrupted. So we call lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 as the parts of lambda. Or more precisely, we call them the parts if they are non-zero. So the number, when I say the number of parts of lambda, it is the number of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 that are non-zero. So for example, I could, I could add some zeros here uh, and it wouldn't change the partition you know, adding a few zeros wouldn't change the partition. It would, um, just like adding uh, zeros to the left of a number written in usual decimal notation, right? So th th these are insignificant. So when I say the number of parts, it is the number of those num integers which are non-zero. So in this example, that would be five because one, two, three, four, five, that's five. And in terms of the shape, it is the number of rows in the shape, number of rows in the shape. Okay. Now, again, I have this issue with how to. Uh, okay. So this is my third place. 
So let us fix an integer n. Right? This is fixed throughout the talk. And I denote by R the polynomial ring in n variables. Z, of course, denotes the ring of integers. And x1 through x1, xn are variables or uh, indeterminates, whatever you want to call them. And so this is the polynomial ring. And we look at, we take lambda to be the subring, the following subring. I have put an Sn here on top. This represents the symmetry group on n letters. So this is the group which permutes these variables. Okay, uh, some of you may not be so familiar with uh, uh, groups and actions. So you can just take lambda to be the ring of symmetric polynomials. So in the sense that we understand from high school. So for example, for a polynomial in, I, 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 here, here, for example, right below is a polynomial that is symmetric in three variables. We'll give an example. We'll give uh, at least two or three examples shortly. Um, party, okay, now fun, comes the first claim. The partitions with at most n parts naturally parametrize basis for this ring. So you may be familiar with basis for uh, vector spaces. Uh, this is not quite a vector space, but it's a, what is called a Z module. And it's a free Z module in the sense that it has a basis, in the sense that those are, you can find linearly independent elements which span the space. So for example, monomials in X1 through Xn will um, form a basis of R, as we all know because every polynomial is uniquely a linear combination with integral coefficients of the monomials, okay? Now, here we are claiming that partitions with at most 10 parts naturally parametrize a basis for the subring lambda, right? How, do, how does this happen? Okay, so I, let's do this by example. So if I take lambda to be four plus three plus one, and I take the number of variables to be three. So uh, this has three parts. So it's okay because I have said the partition must be, must have at most n parts, n equals three. So this has three parts, so it's okay. So what is the more, um, the symmetric, uh, what is the element of uh, gamma that corresponds to this partition? You write it as follows. You write x1 to the 4, x2 cubed, x3. So these exponents come from these numbers, 4, 3, 1. Right? And if there are certain zeros in front, like for example, if n were 5, I would write x, imagine x4 to the 0 and x5 to the 0 there. That's what it would be. Okay? And uh, it is not just this one, but of course, this by itself is not symmetric, so it wouldn't belong to lambda, plus the other obvious ones in order to make this symmetric. So, so I just write all possible, uh, you know, x1, x2, x3, and aha, I see a typo here. This should be x2, x3. This should be x2, and this should be x3. Okay. So, I have written here four, three, one, all. I, I keep the same base x1, x2, x3, x1, x2, x3, and permute this four, three, one in all possible ways. So here is four, three, one, four, one, three, three, four, one, three, one, four, one, four, three, and one, three, four. Okay. This is a four. Okay, so clearly um, this is a uh, element of lambda and uh, this forms about, um, the m lambda. I've written it here as lambda varies over partitions with at most 10 parts, m lambda form a basis for lambda. These are called monomial bases. Just to, just to clarify, if 
I take the same partition and consider it for uh, with four variables, then m lambda will have 24 terms. What, what will be the other terms? So for example, with x1, x2, x4, for example, with same 4, 3, 1, you will get six more terms. In fact, six terms for each choice of three variables from x1, x2, x3, x4. Okay. Uh, again, once again, please stop me if something is not clear. Okay. So the monomial basis is not so interesting for us. Here is a much more interesting basis. It's called the basis of sure polynomials. So again, these form a basis for the ring lambda of symmetric polynomials in n variables. This as in the previous slide. Lambda is as in the previous slide. Once again, lambda is a partition with at most 10 parts. So I'm going to define this polynomial, sure polynomial by example. Okay, here is the example I want to take. Lambda is two plus one, this partition, its corresponding shape is this, and I, I'll take n equal to three. Okay. So what you do is fill these uh, boxes with numbers. And before looking at this, these fillings, let's look at these, uh, uh, the, what is written here. The boxes are filled with one, two, up to n. Okay. So you, you have this n equal to three here, which means I fill these boxes with one, two, or three. The repetitions are okay. I can use the same number any number of times, no problem. Um, I can also, I am not also obliged to use one of the numbers. If I don't use three, that's okay. Or if I don't use a two, that's okay. Or if I don't use a bunch of them, that's okay. The conditions are, um, the filling must be strictly increasing downwards along the column. So if you see this column, for example, one, two, I cannot put a one, one here. It has to be strictly increasing or a two, one. It has to be strictly increasing along columns and weakly increasing along rows. Weakly means you can have the same number or you could increase. You cannot decrease. Okay. So let us see in how many different ways I can fill this, um, these boxes subject to these conditions. Well, I have to be increasing along the first column. So what, what, are, what are my choices? I can put one, two, or one, three, or two, three, right? So let us try one, two. So if I put one, two, then, so assume I'm putting one here and two here, then what can I put here? It has to be I, it has to be weakly increasing, so I can put one, two, or three. There you go. So it's one, two with one here, one, two with two here, and one, two with three here. Okay, okay. And so let's try with one, three in the first column. What can I put here again? Because the first here it is one, here it can be one, two, or three. So I get three more. So one, three, one, one, three, two, and one, three, three. Okay, and if I put two, three here in the first column, then I cannot put a one here. It has to be a two or three. So there you go, it's two, three, two, and two, three, three. This exhausts all possible fillings. And what you do is, you for each filling, you write the corresponding monomial. That's easy to do. Just look at those numbers and you will get a monomial. Here it's x1 square x2, x1 square x3, and so on. Here it's x1, x2, x3. And observe that you could get the same monomial from two different um, uh, fillings. And in this case, I'm just getting one like this, but it is possible to get large integers because the same monomial can appear from, can uh, the several different fillings could contribute the same monomial in general. Okay. And so I have this, uh, uh, this sum of monomials, and that is my S lambda. Okay. So let us do uh, two more examples. Okay, suppose I take lambda to be this, right? Just two boxes like this, and I take n equal to four. Then what all can I fill here? I can fill one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, two, one, two, two, not two, one, two, 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 three, two, four, etc. 
and if you write it out you can write any monomial in two in the way of degree 2 in the variables x1 x2 x3 x4 so this is the you will get the complete symmetric polynomial or yeah you will get the sum complete symmetric polynomial which by definition is the sum of all monomials of degree 2 now if you do this if you take this lambda to be this partition 1 plus 1 then uh, the difference between this and this is remember i can this has to be the entries here have to be strictly increasing so what i get is the sum of all square free monomials of degree 2 this if you recall is called the elementary symmetric polynomial and you may have inquired you may have encountered it in high school okay they are very relevant they are very relevant to the um theory that we are talking about but not for this particular talk okay and what is the theorem the first surprising thing is that these are homogeneous that is not at all obvious from the definition so if i look at this for example why should i get a homogeneous thing it is not at all clear but that is the first surprise it is homogeneous and secondly as lambda varies over partitions with at most n parts these s lambda form a basis of this ring z basis of this ring lambda okay this is very essential for uh, our uh, purpose you never mind that you have under, uh, even if you have not understood the definition of s lambda okay it is important to remember that s lambda form a basis for this ring that that is going to be important now so in this slide i am going to give you another definition of s lambda okay these are very important polynomials so here is another uh, definition which is this definition is 200 years old this is cauchy's definition of the schur polynomial so schur was uh, lived uh, uh, somewhere during sometime during the last last part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century cauchy uh, dates from the early part of the 19th century so clearly cauchy already knew schur polynomial so the term schur polynomial uh, comes is given much later after schur's work but the polynomials themselves were known and uh, well known by uh, even in the 19th century and here is his, here is cauchy's definition of this of these polynomials okay so we have been talking about symmetric polynomials but you can talk about anti symmetric polynomials what does this mean if i permute then uh, the i get the same poly, um, uh, polynomial back but with a sign depending on the sign of the permutation i have used for example if i switch two of them x1 and x2 then the um sign switches i get the same polynomial but with a negative sign okay and as you know determinants are a uh, have this anti symmetric property right so here is the most basic anti symmetric polynomial namely the van der mort right x1 through xn so this is the definition and you may remember that this is actually equal to uh xn minus so let me write it in a different color maybe this is equal to xn minus or let me write it like this x1 minus x2 x1 minus x3 and so on x1 minus xn and then x2 minus x3 and so on dot 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 x2 minus xn up to xn minus 1 minus xn so this is an easy exercise which you, we we know do in high school that this determinant equal to this right you observe this by for example saying that if i put x1 equals to x2 this vanishes so x1 minus x2 must divide this similarly each of these must divide this and then you just count that see that the degree this degree matches this etc etc okay so this is an easy exercise so what i do is the following so given a partition i try to cook up another anti symmetric polynomial so here is one way to do this so given a partition i add this partition which i denote rho 
and those of you who are familiar with uh, early algebras will understand what this row means. But uh, never mind, it's, if you don't, that's okay. It is just this partition, which is n minus 1, n minus 2, up 1 bigger than or equal to 0. This is n parts. So, sorry, uh, n minus 1 parts because this is 0. So what I do is, uh, uh, and note what it does. It has one beautiful combinatorial property. Namely, once I add rho, the elements of lambda, which were, uh, you know, weakly, you know, uh, uh, decreasing, now become strictly decreasing because I've added n minus one here and then I added n minus two here. So I I keep adding one less each time. Okay, so these numbers are all different, and I define s lambda to be the determinant of this. This uh, I take this determinant here. This is a matrix divided by the value one. I have written it out explicitly this determinant, the numerator, in a particular example. Lambda is equal to 2 plus 1, n equal to 4. Okay, I've written it out. The point is that this is a anti-symmetric uh, polynomial in the variables. And I'm dividing it one anti-symmetric by another anti-symmetric polynomial. So the result is symmetric. Okay. And why is this a polynomial? Uh, for the reason I said, you know, if you if you realize that the random bond is is uh, has a factorization like this, and observe that if I put x1 equals to x2 in the numerator, it vanishes. Therefore, the random bond must divide the numerator. Okay, so this is indeed a polynomial, and it is um, symmetric because both the numerator and denominator are anti-symmetric. Okay. And uh, then you, uh, this is Cauchy's definition of S lambda. And as we've uh, mentioned in the previous slide, S lambda form a basis of this lambda, the ring lambda of symmetric functions or symmetric polynomials in any variables. Just one more comment. In case you know about the wild character formula, the right hand side, this, this, of this, uh, of this Cauchy's definition of S lambda is nothing but the right hand side of the wild character formula. Okay, never mind if you don't uh, know what the wild char character formula is. Okay, so now we come, I'll define for you, give you the four definitions of Little Wood Richardson coefficients. Here they are. So here is the first definition. So this is the elementary definition, which I claim you should be able to understand. So we have this. So if you have a ring, right, it is not just a Z module, but it's a ring, the ring lambda. So what I can do is I can multiply two basis elements, right? And then I get some other element of the ring and I could express that in terms of the basis elements again. So these numbers are called the multiplicative structure constants. And indeed they are the little wood Richardson coefficients. So it has Littlewood Richardson coefficients have this very simple definition. Okay. And one thing to observe here is that um, C lambda mu nu are independent of n. What this means is, suppose I'm given lambda mu nu, they are some partitions. Now I can consider them, uh, I can take large n and, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, lambda has n in it. That is, it is the symmetric polynomials in n variables. But I can consider these as functions, as polynomials in larger number of variables. Right? So uh, these, uh, it's a simple observation that these do not depend on n. They are independent of n. So it does not um, you know, you interpret lambda and mu, um, uh, you know, I, if I take a much larger n, I'll get the same numbers here. Okay, so you, the n need not bother you. That's the first definition. The second definition, and this is the one I'm going to focus on during the talk. Okay, and that is the following. So these uh, partitions uh, with less than or equal to n parts, also parameterize what are called polynomial representations of GLN. 
Okay, I've written here number of parts of lambda is less than one. Okay. And you can take the tensor product of two polynomial representations. And it is well known that this is a semi-simple category. What that means is you it's every module is completely reduce, completely reducible. So you can write this in terms of um, irreducible representations. Aha, I should say here, irreducible polynomial representations. I missed that. Sorry about that. So polynomial representations are completely reducible. So you can actually write this tensor product as this direct sum. And a little more if you, in case you know uh, some character theory, uh, S lambda is supposed to be the character of this. Okay, So the first definition is related to the second definition. We can pass from the second definition to the first by taking characters. And characters determine representations. Just like for finite groups, uh, if you take finite uh, group representations over complex numbers, then the character uh, determines uh, the representation in a very strong way. For example, you can take tensor products of two irreducible representations and try to express it as a sum of irreducible representations. And that is no more, no less than taking the two characters, multiplying them and expressing the product as a sum of characters. That's precisely what is happening here. And and the character, if you remember, is the trace. And here also, here also, you, there is an interpretation of the character as a trace. What this s lambda is nothing is nothing but it is the trace on this vector space v lambda of this of this matrix. Remember this GLN. This M, M, uh, if I take x1, x2, xn, where these are uh, non-zero numbers, this is the diagonal matrix. That's an element of GLN. And if you take its trace you will get something in x1, x2, xn, and that will be a polynomial because I have considered polynomial representations, whatever that means. So when you take this trace, you get a polynomial, and that will be precisely your short polynomial. Okay. And here is the third definition. I'll be very vague about this, okay? but it could interest uh, those of you who are interested more in topology or geometry. So here is the Grassmannian. Okay, uh, in, in, never mind if you don't know what it is. It's some generalization of projective spaces. Um, so, and you take this cohomology ring with uh, integer integral coefficients. And then uh, this has uh, is a free Z module generated uh, with basis, the, what are called Schubert classes. And those Schubert classes are again indexed by these partitions. And then once again, you multiply these two, um, you can do this, play the same game. And the coefficients that you get will be precisely the same as when you, in the first two cases, okay? It's a remarkable fact. And this comes up in enumerative geometry. Here is yet another definition. This one is from finite group representation theory. Okay. So suppose lambda is a partition of D. Then um, you can associate to lambda what is called spec lambda, which is an irreducible representation of the symmetric group. So here, irreducible representations of the symmetric group S D, S sub D, are parameterized by partitions of D. Okay. Uh, here it was the number of parts. Right? Here it is the it's a partition of D. So here's what you do. You can take the irreducible representation corresponding to lambda and that corresponding to mu. The first one is for the for this symmetry group and the second one is for the second symmetry group. You can take the tensor product. That is an irreducible representation of the direct product of these groups. And you can induce it to this uh, bigger group. Okay, And I have written it out here. And then you can try to decompose it in terms of into irreducible representations of this big symmetric group. And then what you see in front are precisely these coefficients again. Okay, so uh, if you didn't understand any of these except the first, doesn't matter. Okay, so we are, uh, these are, this is just information. 
it is uh, i will not be using any of these uh, at all in the next uh, in the rest of the talk okay so next briefly let me mention two generalizations of these little wood richardson coefficients and two open problems these are famous open problems so uh, so look at the third definition that we had um, there we considered Grassmannians, but instead you could consider what are called other flag varieties. I'm considering, for example, the full flag variety. I'm being a little vague here, but never mind. Uh, it is just to give you an idea. So if I take this more, you know, the, the, um, a little more complicated object and its cohomology ring, and uh, once again, the, uh, it has a basis uh, indexed by Schubert classes, but here the multiplication is not known. So, um, so let's read what I have written. These are represented by Schubert polynomials, which form a basis for the ring, the polynomial ring in infinitely many variables. This is just a convenient thing to take. So there are, so the take away from you for, for, uh, from this slide is that they, they, are, they are what are called Schubert polynomials, and they generalize Schubert polynomials in the sense that Schubert polynomials occur as special cases of Schubert polynomials. And they form a Z basis of this ring, and so you can play the same game, and you can ask for uh, if I multiply two Schubert polynomials and express it as a, a linear combination of Schubert polynomials, what do I get? What are the coefficients? Those multiplicative structure constants are not known for the latter meaning for the Schubert polynomials. And there is an elementary definition of Schubert polynomials given by Lasko and Schoenberger. And this is a rather imprecise statement because I should say the definition of Schubert polynomials was given by Lasko and Schoenberger and it is elementary. You can look up the Wikipedia, for example, there is a very high school definition of Schubert polynomials. And an open problem is we don't know if I take two Schubert polynomials and multiply them and express it in terms of as a linear combination of other Schubert polynomials, uh, what, what, what are the coefficients in front? That is one open problem. Here is another one. Um, this is from symmetric group representation theory. So if I take two partitions, lambda and mu, of the same integer d, now then they parameterize two irreducible representations of the symmetry group SD. Okay? And then I take their tensor product and try to, and as you may know from uh, your algebra course in MSc, that finite group representations over complex numbers are completely reducible. So you can write this as a uh, direct sum of irreducible representations. And that's what I've written here. And the coefficients in front are called the Kronecker coefficients. Okay, and this, they are not known. So we don't know what these are in, in the most general sense. So LR coefficients occur as Kronecker coefficients. So they are a special case. Exactly how, let us not worry. It's a little too complicated to go, get into that now. But what I'm mentioning is that this is a special case. And in fact, they are the, related to this, what are called the stable chronicle coefficients, but never mind. So these are two very famous open problems. And let me also mention that there are computational complexity viewpoints on these problems. So uh, if you are interested in knowing whether uh, the chronicle coefficient is non-zero if, I'm, if I give you lambda mu nu, and then I want to write a program which will tell me whether the Kronecker coefficient is non-zero, whether that uh, finishes in polynomial time or what kind of uh, complexity class it belongs to, that is the kind of questions I'm, I'm talking about. Here. So there are many open problems. Okay. Okay. Now coming back to our little wood Richardson coefficients. So there is a classical rule given by Littlewood Richardson, and maybe their proof had a uh, 
you know, there is a long history to this rule. I, um, I don't know precisely the history myself, but it's all uh, well understood. It is elementary, but a bit involved. And so for lack of time, I will not get into that rule here. So uh, we will not bother giving its description here, but it is entirely elementary. Anybody who understands high school mathematics can uh, read up that rule and apply it. Okay, so you can, here is the reference, you can look up the Wikipedia. But there is another reason why I'm not going to do this because I'm going to give another, another way to compute the little wood richardson coefficients, namely the high rule of Knudsen power. That's coming up. So there is no need for you, me to give you another rule. I, I'm giving, going to give you a more modern rule. So I'm skipping this. Okay. However, I want to give you a very special case. Let us do the following. I, rather than multiplying two general sure um, polynomials, I assume that the second one is this simple one given by a, the parameterized by a single box, right? Whose young shape is a single box. So uh, uh, if you remember our uh, definition, uh, this turns out to be just this polynomial x1, x2, xn. Why? Because I just have to fill this with a number. And if I, I can fill this with one, two, three up to n, and then I get x1 plus x2 plus xn, okay? And here is the nice rule. It's called Peary's rule. Here is the nice combinatorial rule for multiplying any given sure polynomial with the with this particular one. So what do you do? You just start, try to add a box to this partition, right? And uh, to the shape rather, and try to keep it a shape. So for example, I can add it to the first row. I can add it to the second row. I cannot add it to the third row because, because the second, you know, if adding it here, here would would uh, would not make it a shape because here uh, there it, it will be a problem. This will become two and this will become three, but that's not a partition. That's not a valid shape. So I cannot add it here, but I can add it here, right? So you just write down all po possible different ways of adding this box, and that indeed is the. Um, how to write it. So this pretty rule is called Peary's rule and it's a very special case of little wood Richardson. Okay, just to give you a flavor of what it looks like. And of course, you can, uh, in this case, you see that, uh, I mean, this is in general true what I've written down here. Uh, this coefficient is zero unless the number of boxes in the shape of new equals uh, the number of boxes in the shapes lambda and the sum of them. That is obvious because the degree of this uh, S lambda is going to be the this uh, mod lambda. So when I multiply a polynomial with degree lambda, degree mod lambda with one that is degree lambda, um, lambda mod mu, I obviously get something that is of uh, this degree, right? And if I express it as a linear combination of uh, these homogeneous uh, polynomials, then everything on the right side must also be of degree of the same degree. So this is uh, obvious. So maybe this is a good time to pause and uh, are there any questions? Oh, please feel free to interrupt me, uh, but I, I, I assume uh, things are clear and proceed. Okay, now we, I tell you the high rule of Knudsen power to compute LR coefficients. This is a very interesting rule. So this is what you do. Okay, you draw this picture. Okay, I've drawn this picture for n equal to four. Right, you, so you draw, this is called a high. You draw a grid of triangles like this. Okay. So what is this n equal to 4 doing? So this is 1, 2, 3, 4. The, it's an equilateral triangle. The outer thing is an equilateral triangle with length 4. You see there is 4 units here. 1, 2, 3, 4. Right. Okay. So it's clear what to draw. And I label it as follows. I put 0 on top. Right. Lambda 1 at this vertex. 
lambda 1 plus lambda 2 at this vertex, lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 at the third vertex, and lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 plus lambda 4, which is this mod lambda at this corner. Okay. And then I keep going on this side, and then I put add mu 1, add mu 1 plus mu 2. This is a plus mu 2. If it is not clear, this is a plus mu 2. Sorry. And this is this is a plus mu three, plus mu two plus mu three. Okay, so here is lambda, but of course I'm not putting lambda one, lambda two. I'm putting lambda one, lambda one plus lambda two. You know, it's just a slight variation. Here I am putting mu's, but again I'm adding mu one successively. You know, the differences here are mu, give mu one, mu two, mu three, mu four, and on this side lambda. And here is the beautiful combinatorial um, uh, way to compute this little wood Richardson coefficient given by Nutz and Tau. So here is their, the number of different assignments f of vertices to non-negative integers such that. So what does this mean? I try to assign vertices. Uh, I, I try to assign non-negative integers to every vertex. Okay? The outer vertices are assigned that is, the boundary values are given by lambda mu nu as shown. So once I am given lambda mu nu, I am given the values on the boundary. Okay. Now, I must choose non-negative integers for the internal vertices such that the rhombi inequalities. And what's, what are the rhombi inequalities? They are very simple. So there are, in this picture, you can see three kinds of rhombi. So there are these vertical rhombi. And there are these two, two kinds of slanting rhombi. One that slants to the east, maybe, and the other one, whatever. One, one that slants northeast, southwest, and the other one that slants the other direction. Okay, so there are these three rhombi orientations. And for every rhombus, such rhombus, the entries at the obtuse vertices, right, where the obtuse angle vertices, their sum must exceed the sum on the acute angle vertices. Okay, So I fill in numbers here, all possible ways, such that these rhombi inequalities hold. Okay, And the total number of possibilities is this number, C lambda mu. So let me pause here. I hope uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is a stunning kind of uh, um, uh, theorem and uh, it's a good time to just pause and ask if you have any questions. Let's do an example. Let's do an example. Okay. Here is the example I wanted. Okay. So we saw in the previous slide this Peary rule, right? Okay. So in this particular case, let's work out how this uh, um, thing turns out. So here I write, so what are the so here I write, so I'm taking n equal to 3, right? n equal to 3 I'm taking. Okay. So, uh, so here is 0. And what are these numbers? These are determined by lambda. 3 is the first part. This is lambda 1. And this is lambda 1 plus lambda 2 because it's 3 plus 2, 5, and, three, and this is 7. Okay. I hope these numbers are clear. Mu is just 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Right. Okay. So I add 1 to 7. And then 0, 0. Right. Okay. Now, I don't know what the news I'll get. So I'll keep these open. Okay. But the point is, I must start filling in these numbers such that the rhombi inequality is whole. Okay. So let's see. I have to fill in something here. So there you go. This is five. These are obtuse. 8 plus 5 is 13. So this sum must not exceed 13. So this question mark here must be less than or equal to 6 because of the rhombi inequality determined by this rhombus. On the other hand, let's look at this rhombus. This acute is 11. Right? So this obtuse must be at least 11, the, the sum of these. So this must be at least 6. So on the one hand, this, this question mark is less than or equal to 6. On the other hand, 
it is bigger than or equal to 6. So it must only be equal to 6. So here I can only put 6, no other choice. Okay. And if you look at this double question mark, and then if you look at these two rhombi here, it is easy to see that this should also be 6. Okay. Okay. And now let us see what I can put here. So this is 6, right? So here it is 6. The, the sum of these two are cubes, if I look at this vertical form. So here, what can I put? I, have, I cannot put, um, I have to put something bigger than or equal to 3. Because these, the, this must add up to at least 6. Okay, But then there is a condition here which comes. This is 6 and this is 6. Therefore, I cannot put more than 4 here. So the only possibilities here are 3 and 4, right? So the here, so here is always 6. So this is always 6. And this is 3 comma 4. So there are, uh, there are two possibilities for new, which I have listed here, 3, 6, 8, 4, 6, 8, which correspond precisely to this 4, 2, 2, and 3, 3, 2, which is this, OK? Of course, you can start complaining, where did this go? What happened to this? So we seem to have made a mistake. The resolution is the following. See, because I've taken n equal to 3, okay, here's the explanation. Nu is equal to this last one does not occur because we have implicitly chosen n equal to 3. It would occur for hives of larger size. If you take the same data, lambda mu nu, but make a larger hive, and then this will also appear. So there will be three possibilities then if you work it out. and you will get this as well. OK. OK, so this is the same slide as before. So now I come to the saturation theorem. So this is now, it is obvious from this description that if I take k times lambda, so what I mean by this is just multiply every entry by some scalar k, which is a positive integer. Okay, so I take this partition and multiply every part by k. Take, a, take mu and multiply it every part by k. And I want to ask, I want to ask for this coefficient. Then this says I should put k, to, I, I, the boundary values are multiplied by k. So whenever I have an integral solution for this c lambda mu nu, right? Whenever there is an integral solution to the hive, there is, it contributes to the right hand side, but then I can just multiply that solution by k everywhere. That will be a solution for this. And it's obvious, it's, this is obvious. I'm claiming this is obvious from the above description. Okay. Now here comes the theorem. If this hive has a real solution, meaning I can put entries, not integer entries now, but real entries, such that the rhombi inequalities hold. That's what it means to say this has a real solution. Then it has a solution in the non-negative integers. This is the theorem of Knudsen and Tau. Okay. Of course, we are keeping the boundary values to be lambda mu nu, which are these partitions, and therefore they are integral. Now, a corollary of this is the following: that if this coefficient is non-zero, then this smaller coefficient is non-zero. And that is the saturation theorem. Okay? And the reason is because this. So suppose I, I have a solution for this, means I have k lambda on the boundary, k mu on the boundary here, k nu on the boundary here, and some integer solutions in the center. Right? Now, if I want to get a solution for this from that solution for this, what should I do? I should divide by k. Now, when I divide the boundary by k, everything is okay. k lambda will become lambda, k mu will become mu, k nu will become nu. However, I have no guarantee that the inter entries inside are divisible by k, right? So what I get may not be an integer solution. It will only be a real solution. But then this theorem says, if it has a real solution, then it has an integral solution. So I conclude that this is non zero. Okay? okay. So this is the proof of their beautiful theorem. 
and let me in the final minutes just tell you briefly about what our refined version of it and finish okay so very quickly what we i mean by refined little wood richardson coefficients um is the following so you recall the second definition which was uh, using this polynomial representations of GLN. So you, these little wood richardson coefficients come up when you take two irreducible representations and decompose them as a sum of irreducible representations. Now, there are these, there is a natural filtration of this, of this tensor product by other, by representations of GLN. Okay. The, uh, these are called the constant Kumar modules. Okay, and they have a certain decomposition. And those decompositions are what we call the refined LR coefficients. Okay, and there are these properties. So what are these per indexed by? These are indexed by permutations in SN. And there is a partial order on SN, which is called the Bruja order. This is very elementary to describe. If you don't know it, maybe it's, a, you know, as an MSc student, you can read about this. So these respect the Bruja order in that, in, in the following sense. And moreover, uh, in this Bruja order, there is a unique longest element. And what is that? It's described like this. So what this means is if you write it in one line notation, this permutation is n, n minus one. That is one goes to n, two goes to n minus one, et cetera, n goes to one. That is the longest element in the Bruja order in SN. And if I take W to be the longest element, I get the whole tensor product. Okay, so this is a nice filtration. And the refinement of the LR coefficients are determined by the decompositions of these uh, modules in the filtration. Okay, and here is my last slide. Oh, last but one slide. Okay, okay this is what we have the this corner is what we've already seen. The extra thing I'm telling you here is that just like there is a decomposition rule, LR rule, there is a classical LR rule, this refined rule, right? That is due to Joseph. And last year with uh, uh, Murgendra and uh, Vishwanath, we worked on this problem. And uh, here is the archive reference. We study these constant Kumar modules using Littleman paths, whatever that means. And the, here is the result: path models for uh, constant Kumar modules. That's our. That's what the main result is. And we also prove certain PRV type results for these uh, uh, constant Kumar modules. And PRV stands for Parthasarathy Rangarao Varadarajan, three Indian names. Uh, coming from their annals paper in 1966. Okay. Okay, and here's the last slide. So using res recent research of uh, Fujita, here is the archive reference, August 2020. We get a high model for these refined coefficients. Okay, so uh, never mind the details, uh, the point is, just like you have a high model Nux and Tau high model for the full LR coefficients, you can also get a high model for these refined coefficients. And th they are actually very easy to describe. So here, read this. Never mind what dual Kogan phases are. Read this. This means simply that certain rhombi inequalities are replaced by equalities. So instead of e inequalities, you insist on equalities in certain positions depending on this given W. And you count the same kind of hive, uh, how many hives you get. And that gives you this number. And here is our theorem. If W is 312 avoiding or 231 avoiding, in the obvious sense, uh, I'm not defining this, but it's it's it should be clear what it means. Then you have saturation for these uh, refined uh, LR coefficients as well. And the po note, point to note is that the full uh, the W naught is three to one avoiding. So this includes the saturation theorem. However, our proof relies on the original proof, unfortunately. So we are not getting an independent proof. That would have been very nice, but we are not getting that. And also just to mention that this, uh, uh, this hypothesis is possibly removable. We don't have a counter example to show that if I remove this hypothesis, then uh, that this is not true. 
However, our proof only works in this case. Okay. Uh, and finally, there is a connection between LR coefficients and saturation to Horn's problem. Okay. If you don't know what this is, again, uh, you can look up the internet. This is a famous problem. And in fact, uh, the work related to this problem is what uh, uh, started, I think, Nutsan Tavo on uh, the saturation problem. Okay, um, thank you for your attention. Sorry if I've gone over time. Thank you, Dagavan. Are there any questions or comments? Srijit, any questions in the chat box? Uh, there are no questions in the chat box, sir. YouTube, there are no questions. I guess it's been a long uh, <laughs> two days, and you're looking forward to another few days of this. So, yeah, people must be tired. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, you can also email me. I'll happy, happy to give you references or answer your questions. Thank you for the invitation.